Captain A.W. Reynolds to Major General Jessup, June 29th, 1858. Dear Sir, thus terminates my mission, and thus terminates the military character of old Fort Snelling. Fort Snelling, the child of the infantry in the ark of the Western emigrant. No more shall the flag wave over its venerable walls. No more shall the thunder of the cannon declare the power that erected it. No more shall martial music quicken the step of the soldier within its hallowed precincts. It is gone. regulations concerning credit. Obviously not. Nor, I see, are you aware of the fact that you are already $2.50 in debt to me. Private Gutman, you make $5 a month, and I can't give you credit for more than half your monthly wages. God hunt me down, Leonard. You ask any man in this fort, and he'll tell you that John Gutman is as honest as the day is long. Now, I want credit. Sorry. <laughs> Private John Gutman, a student at Cornell, is part of the Fort Snelling restoration. Every day he retraces the steps of those who made the post what it was and what it is today. Fort Snelling, one of the most authentic restorations in the nation, gradually taking shape on a bluff above the junction of the Mississippi and the Minnesota rivers on the southern fringe of the Twin Cities. Stone walls defying exploding urban developments Founded by freeways and airport and space age industries, this island of the past has come to life. The battle for the preservation of the old fort began with a freeway threat pointed at the round tower. It stimulated efforts to save what was left of Minnesota's oldest buildings. The highway department gave way to this protest and built the freeway through a tunnel to save the fort site. In 1960, Fort Snelling was designated Minnesota's first national historic landmark. And in 1965, the $3.5 million project began. Funded by the state of Minnesota under the supervision of the Minnesota Historical Society. Reconstruction begins from ground up. In the earth, archaeologists find clues to the mysteries of a buried past. Slowly and precisely, they peel away the layers, screening every shovelful, searching for coin, button, marble, shoes. Every artifact becomes a piece in a gigantic jigsaw puzzle. 
Each piece is analyzed to determine what it is, how it was used, and by whom. The remains are gently probed with picks and shovels, then scrutinized with trowels and paintbrushes. The excavation continues until the very foundations are unearthed. 31.2. From these crumbling pieces, the archaeologists yeah. map exact dimensions of the original building, recreating a 19th century blueprint of Fort Snelling. Then the rebuilding begins. Modern day masons and carpenters have to duplicate the work of original craftsmen. They relearn old techniques, paying strict attention to detail. The cedar shakes on the roof duplicate the hand-hewn pine shingles split by Snelling's men. A West Virginia company makes the glass with all its characteristic waves and bubbles. The first time the fort was built, it took 250 men four years. This time, it will take the combined efforts of archaeologists, historians, architects, contractors, and craftsmen ten years. Through the years, artists have kept Fort Snelling alive. In the early 19th century, this fortress stood for American authority in the Northwest Territory. The struggle to establish the fort began when Jefferson was president. In 1805, he ordered Lieutenant Zebulon Pike to explore the area and obtain land for a military post. From Pike's journal, this account, September 23, 1805. The chief standard. I addressed them in a speech which, though long, touched on many points. The principal ones were the granting of the land and making peace with the Chippewas. They gave me the land required, but spoke doubtfully relative to the peace. Pike got a bargain price, $2,600 for nearly 100,000 acres. Realizing that action was necessary to establish American authority over this sprawling area, John C. Calhoun, Secretary of War, proposed a chain of forts. Addressing the House of Representatives, December 14, 1818, Calhoun said, On the Mississippi, Missouri, Arkansas, and the Red Rivers, our posts are now, or will be extended shortly, for the protection of our trade and the preservation of the peace of the frontiers. In September 1820, Colonel Snelling arrived and selected the scenic and strategic site for the permanent fort home of the United States 5th Regiment. The strength of Colonel Snelling's fortress was never tested. It never fired a cannon at an enemy, never fired a shot in defense. It just stood there, a symbol of power and force. What Fort Snelling did do was to house the first school, the first Protestant church, the first library, the first jail, the first post office, the first hospital, and Minnesota's first brass band. This was the birthplace of Minnesota. By the 1850s, Fort Snelling's power was declining, and the area was planned for a town site. The city of Fort Snelling was never built. Through more than a century and a quarter, the fort was a military center for the region and the nation in time of peace and war. Fort Snelling opened and closed as the nation needed it for war. In 1946, with World War II over, Fort Snelling closed for what most everyone thought would be the last time. Sergeant uh, Simpson will proceed with 10 men to Rum River to continue cutting wood. Lieutenant Green will be in charge of detail working the company gardens. Today, students are bringing history alive within the walls of old Fort Snelling, living in a world 150 years ago. Recruits must be 18 to 35, at least 5'6", white and able-bodied. It will be well to take a deserter alive, but better to shoot him than let him escape. The life of a soldier was a hard and lonely one, regulated from morning till night by drum signals. Breakfast by the drum, duty call by the drum, extra whiskey by the drum. Fort Snelling was isolated from the closest city, St. Louis, by three weeks' journey in the summer and by the weather 
in the winter. The men, women, and children of the garrison had to be self-sufficient. To the enlisted man, it seemed like endless labor, tending crops, standing guard, cutting firewood. Commissioned officer will superintend all wood chopping detail. A sentinel will be posted at the gate to prevent pilfering of the blacksmith coal. <laughs> Ringing clamor, iron against iron, echoes inside the sooted walls of the blacksmith shop. Fellows intensify the heat of a hot July day. Nail rods are fired to 2300 degrees. Then the blacksmith hammers the soft yellow heat into a single nail. With continual and determined pounding, forging axe heads, cooking utensils, all in chains. The main point that we are here for is to portray military and frontier life of the 1820s. So we have to study the history of the place very well and know what exactly went on, and then in some way portray that to the people. Being a student of theater, and studying acting, it's given me a lot of opportunities to be in front of people and just being able to come in contact with people, eye contact, not being afraid of being in front of an audience at all. You can be an Irish immigrant, a French immigrant, a German immigrant, you can be anybody you want. I think the one thing that benefits this restoration the most is the fact that the staff is a very close-knit unit and they all have a common cause. And I really think that without them, this place would be nothing, regardless of administration or policies or where we get the money. Door to the blacksmith, the carpenter works, surrounded by scraps and shavings. Taking raw timber, he makes plows, door frames, tables. Under his rhythmic hand, logs are squared, chiseled, and carved. for all companies will be issued every day, one hour before the breakfast drum. Orderly sergeants will supervise the delivery.
more bread. Every day, the baker makes 400 loaves to stretch the soldier's meager, monotonous diet, taking 11 gallons of water, 2 gallons of yeast, 3 pounds of salt, to 196 pounds of flour. Army regulations stated that fresh bread was not to be served. It was to be toasted or aged several days. Active yeast caused the Fort Snelling quick step. It takes a certain kind of person to work on here. You have to enjoy history and uh, people and talking. You know, the people come out and ask questions, and you keep talking, and they ask questions, you keep talking. We have our fun moments, too, you know, when we do skits. You know, just portraying somebody that you knew once existed, you know, 150 years ago. You sort of stop and think about it once in a while. They can really uh, see how history was. You know, it's not just like reading it or listening to a tape or a record. It's right here. It's just like it was, exactly like it was. So they're not only seeing history, but they're living it. You know, once you step through that gate, it's 1824. The Baker Private Rich was court-martialed for misappropriation of 18 barrels of government flour. He was found guilty of selling 18 ounce loaves of bread to hungry enlisted men for 12 and a half cents each. Really a violation of regulation. The daily ration for the enlisted men was a soup made of beef or pork and vegetables, a loaf of bread, and a gill of whiskey. Few enlisted men had wives and children with them. The Army permitted only one soldier out of 17 to bring his wife. Wives of the enlisted men shared army rations and worked alongside their soldier husbands as laundresses. For 50 cents a month, they washed all the garrison's laundry through regulation whiteness. Cotton clothing will be bleached and ready to wear the first Sabbath in May. Women can wash in their rooms, but not throw water on the parade. Ever since I started working out here, my values on things have changed greatly. I realized that people really had to work hard. They didn't have it as easy as we do now, like sitting home, throwing things in the washing machine, using a sewing machine to make all your clothes, or going to the store and buy it. It's just much different, and I appreciate it a lot. In fact, I hand sew a lot of my own clothes now. It's the only place I know of where they have live interpretation as far as interpreting the actual period, rather saying this, this was where the people did um, the blacksmithing. We say, this is where I make all the things for the fort. And I think it's a good idea. People understand history easier, and I think they're more interested in it because they can, again, relate to it. I've learned to enjoy people more. I can talk to people easier. And I've really taken a liking to history. That's what I plan to go in now because of working out here. I really love it a lot. I've met a lot of new people, just learned a lot of new things that I didn't know before about how, oh, how hard it was for them to live up here. The conditions must have been just unbelievable. The enlisted men's families were squeezed into tiny rooms at the ends of the two barracks. The rest of the soldiers slept 25 to a room. The bunks were three levels high with two men sharing straw stuffed mattresses. The ranks of the soldiers were filled with the shiftless and the outcasts from Eastern society. Some of the best recruits were immigrants wanting to learn English. Pay was low, $6 a month. Drunkenness and desertion were the common offenses. Colonel Snelling wants it distinctly understood that no individual who disgraces himself and the Corps by public and shameless drunkenness may expect any favor from him. Discipline was enforced by the cat and nine tails solitary confinement on bread and water. Fort Snelling is the story of ambitious city-bred officers, of enlisted men who are rationed pork, bread, and whiskey, of official teas and dinners, of convicted deserters, of soldiers who have to plead for a second pair of boots. Once again, you can see the flag waving over its venerable walls. Again, the martial music quickens the step of the soldier. Again, you can hear the thunder of the cannon. Regimental order number 122. A regimental court martial will convene in the schoolhouse at 4 p.m. this day for the trial of such prisoners as may be brought before it by order of Colonel Snelling, P.R. Green, adjutant. 
Private Gutman, do you object to any members of the court? No, sir. Private John Gutman, you are first charged with infraction of paragraph 353, general regulations, to wit, the sutler shall not credit any enlisted soldier within the same month to an amount exceeding one half of his monthly pay without the sanction in writing of the man's company commander. Specification in the Private John Gutman of Company A, 5th Infantry, at Fort Snelling on or about noon, July 24th, 1823, did attempt to purchase sundry items on credit, being at the time in debt to the sutler, Mr. Leonard, for half his monthly pay. Private Gutman, how do you plead to the specification of the first charge and the first charge? Not guilty, sir. Private Gutman, you are second charged with riot and disorderly conduct in violation of standing post orders. Now, Private Gutman, how much do you owe Captain Leonard, the sutler? I don't remember, sir. You don't remember. How much in the way of goods have you purchased in the sutler store since the 1st of July, 1823? All I can remember is some whiskey and some chewing tobacco. Did you demand credit from the sutler? Yes, sir. And what happened when you were refused credit? I got angry, sir. You became angry. Private Gutman, take a seat. Captain Luther Leonard, Fort Snelling Sutler. Captain Leonard, will you please describe what occurred between yourself and Private Gutman on the 24th of July in your establishment? Well, Private Gutman attempted to purchase approximately $2 worth of merchandise on credit, and I knew that he already owed the store approximately $2.50, so I couldn't give him any more credit, and he then knocked a stack of tin cups on the floor. The court, after mature deliberation, finds the prisoner, Private John Guffman of Company A, 5th Infantry, guilty of both specifications and both charges, and sentences him to be confined to the guardhouse at hard labor for 14 days, to wear a ball and chain on his legs, Court marshals such as Private Gutman's were frequent in the 1820s, but even more frequent in the 1970s. From May to October, the Fort Snelling staff, taking their cue from the past, is trained to act the parts of soldiers, craftsmen, and laundresses. We call this living interpretation, and it is meant to involve you, the visitor, in the human and personal side of history. You may ask the carpenter if Mrs. Snelling's chair is ready, or you can ask Private Gutman if he received a fair trial. This restoration offers you the opportunity to participate in Minnesota's foremost bicentennial effort. We invite you to celebrate the spirit of our country's beginning. Join us now on Fort Snelling's most festive day, the 4th of July. Soldiers of the 5th! Honored civilian guests, as George Washington once said, liberty and order must be our inseparable companion. We must first, last, and always be American. The inspiring leadership of men such as Washington, former President Jefferson, and President James Monroe shall give us the moral fervor with which to carry forth the banner of democracy against the forces of despotism. Just as our army, under men such as our gallant Colonel Snelling has carried our banner against the forces of tyranny in 1776 and again in 1812. We must be the moral leaders of the world. As a God-fearing and Christian nation, we can do no other. Let us now have three rousing cheers for the United States of America. Hip, hip! Hooray! Hip, hip! Hooray! Hip, hip! Hooray! Let us have three rousing cheers for the President of the United States, James Monroe. Hip, hip! Hooray! Hip, hip! Hooray! Hip, hip! Hooray! Hip, hip! Hooray! And now, let us have three very rousing cheers for our own commander here, Colonel Josiah Snelling. Hip, hip! Hooray! Hip, hip! Hooray! Hip, hip! Hooray! Hip, hip! Hooray! Thank <laughs> you.